107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those He redeemed from trouble, and gathered from the lands, from east and from west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wonderful works to humankind. For he satisfies the thirsty, and the hungry he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in gloom, prisoners in misery and in irons. For they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Their hearts were bowed down with hard labor. They fell down with no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and gloom and broke their bonds asunder. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wonderful works to humankind, for He shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars, bars of iron. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them from their distress. He sent out His Word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of His deeds with songs of joy. The Word of God for us, the people of God today. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I have this thing that I have done for years. I have done it for many years. I don't maybe over a decade now. And in, in teaching, in Bible study, or in preaching, I don't have it uh, laid out for you this morning, but I, I do this simple, these simple math problems, about five. And it's like two plus two equals four plus four equals. 7 plus 3 equals 4 plus 2. Alright, so, but then I'll put on there, you know, out of 5, I'll put on there like 7. Like I did that this morning on a, a slide in the, the uh, PowerPoint over in the contemporary service. I put one problem, 7 plus 3 equals 11. Okay? And I ask everybody, I say, look, look at this slide and tell me what you notice. And every single time, every time I've ever done this, and I've done it many times, but every single time I've done it, without fail, everybody says, you've got one wrong. You've got one wrong. And I say, well, what else do you notice? And most of the time, most of the time, probably maybe 99.9% .9 of the time, Nobody says anything else. That's it. I got four out of five right, but nobody ever says that. Now, four out of five, Dawn Emery was in the contemporary service this morning, and I said, that would give me a passing grade in your class with four out of five. That'd be, I'm not too good at math, but 80%. I know Russell and Joe are pretty good at math. 80%, that's not bad. That's, that's right, isn't it? Four out of five? Yes. No, it, yeah, that's right, okay. Yeah, 20, 20, yeah, here we go. Help me out, help me out this morning. And in life, it's good to notice the negative. It's good to notice what's wrong. It can save our life, even. If you're walking through the woods and you come across a rattlesnake, you may want to take note that you may need to tread carefully. Caution may keep you from getting really sick or even possibly dying. It can save your life. So we need to pay attention to what's wrong. We need to pay attention to the things that are not quite right in our lives. But we should not get fixated on those things. But it's so 
easy to do, isn't it? To laser in on what's wrong, and because we only see what's wrong, we can't see what? That's right. And therefore, we have a hard time being thankful. Now, thankfulness is a discipline. In prayer, prayer should be our daily discipline as Christians. We should pray. And a general good guide to how our prayer life should be uh, can be summed up by an acronym that I've, I've used with our kids, and I teach it in uh, other settings, but uh, it's the acronym ACTS. A-C-T-S. ACTS. Prayer, our discipline of prayer should begin with adoration. Praise. Adoration and praise of God for who God is. C stands for confession. Part of our daily prayer life should be confession of sins. Confession of our sins. Maybe at the end of the day. Confession. And then T stands for, guess what? Thanksgiving. Now if you've confessed your sins, the Bible says He is faithful, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of most unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. And then we can give thanks. First and foremost for that thanksgiving. In our time of prayer, we begin to thank God for everything He has given us, for the blessings in our life. First and foremost, for the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! That should put a little pep in our step and a smile on our face every single day. And then the last thing is S. S stands for supplication. Supplication or asking for needs to be met. Supplication. That shouldn't be at the top or be the, the overall theme of our prayer life, but it should be included in our prayer life. God commands us. God desires us to make our request known to Him for our needs to be met. But if that's all our prayer life is, we're missing the boat. We're missing out. And we need to drive our minds because it's so easy to get fixated on the negative. Now we need to be honest about our lives. I'm not calling here for denial, for burying our heads in the sand. I thought about today also sharing Psalm 77. Psalm 77 is a psalm that I, I won't read it today, but it begins with a guy expressing his regret, expressing anguish and pain, expressing hopelessness even. He, he even asked himself, has God's grace been completely abandoned? Is God's steadfast love completely gone for me? Does God even care anymore, basically, about me? I don't know about you, but I'm going to be honest with you today. There have been days and there have been times in my life where I have wondered. Have you? The Psalms guide us in our prayer because they guide us in honest prayer. I'm not saying this morning don't pay attention to the names. I'm just saying don't get stuck. Don't get stuck. Pay attention to what's right, but be honest about what's wrong. And then that can drive either confession, confession of sins, and supplication, where we begin to ask God to help us in those areas that are wrong. But let's not get stuck there. Let's remember. Because in that Psalm 77, after he goes through this whole list and litany of things that are wrong in his life and wondering if God even cares anymore, basically, wondering if God's steadfast love is gone forever, he then, he says, then I remember. Then I remember. In prayer, we have to drive our minds to remember God's faithfulness. God's blessings. God's mighty acts in our lives. And when we drive our minds to specifically remember those things and to praise God for those things 
and to thank God for those things. Often I have found in my own personal prayer life, and you may have too, that when we do that, then the heaviness begins to lift. The, 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 the bars of iron become broken. And we begin, begin to be set free from those emotions that bind us and weigh us down. I don't know about you, but I've had days where at the end of the day I'm so tired. And not just from physical exhaustion, but many days from emotional exhaustion. From just weariness. Even sadness and depression at times. And I get in the shower and I just put my head against the wall. I can barely lift my head because of the heaviness. And I just begin to pray. You ever feel that way? That's honest. That's okay. Let's not get stuck with our head against the wall. Let's lift up our head and remember God's mighty acts of salvation. I begin to think back on my life many times when I'm struggling through these things. And I think about how God has shown up in so many miraculous and powerful and incredible ways in my life. I begin to think about, look where I came from and look where I am now. And what God has delivered me from. And the power of God that was manifested in that deliverance. And I just praise God. And I become thankful. Very thankful. But you know there's something we need to realize is that thankfulness is not natural. I do not believe that it's natural. I believe in our, our, our sinful nature. In our natural state. It's a rebellion against God. We're not thankful. We're mad. We're peeved. We're upset. We're distraught. We're distressed. And we are upset with God. And a lot of times we're, the God that we're upset with is the God who hasn't given us everything we want. Now that's not the true God. We're not really mad. We think we're mad at the true God, but we're really not. We're mad at the idol that we have created. Someone, uh, Grace, and then someone just uh, in the hallway out there was sharing a story. But Grace, uh, this week came home from school. We always have a family devotion time at supper. We eat supper together every night. We talk, we pray, and I you know, uh, read Bible stories. And I teach my kids different things about the Bible and about relationship with God. And, and Grace talked about this young man in her school in WC Friday who is just angry. He's angry with God. But he says he's an atheist. He says he doesn't believe in God. He believes in science. And everybody knows if you believe in science, you can't believe in the Bible because they don't go together, which is not true. There have been many great scientists who have been very devout believers. Many of the smartest people in the world are devout Christian believers. The guy Francis Collins who mapped out the human genome is a believer in Jesus Christ. Back in the 1990s, remember when they mapped out the human genome? He was the one who led that program. He is a believer. Not just in God, but in Jesus Christ. So they don't go against each other. This is all portrayed. But this young man says, I don't believe in God. And, and, and God, basically, He's the one who when you pray, He doesn't answer your prayers. That's who God is. The one who, when you pray, he doesn't answer your prayers. And he revealed his heart as being hostile and angry with this God because it's a God who's not given him what he wants. He's been led to believe that God is this, this being who, who is the, the big genie in the sky who's supposed to make sure you have the perfect life. And if you don't have it, what are you going to naturally be? You're going to be, are you going to be thankful? If you believe that you're supposed to have this perfect life, everything is supposed to be wonderful, you can't help but to be angry and mad. And that's because we come with an entitlement mentality. You cannot be thankful if you don't have a humble heart. If you have an entitlement mentality. You can't truly be thankful. 
you won't ever be thankful. But if you know, if you absolutely get the fact that we don't deserve anything, nothing, that everything that we have, everything that we have, there is not one thing that we have that we have earned. Now you, you may get me a little bit later than preacher talk me. By God, you don't know how hard I have worked for all of such and such and such and such that I have. I earned that. So I can say, well, look at Bill Gates. Look at Bill Gates. Bill Gates, obviously, obviously Bill Gates has earned all of that. He used his mind and he made good decisions. And look how well off he is because of it. He is a, I hear this all the time, you do too, self, he's a self what? Self-made man. Blasphemy. Uh, Renee Malarkey. She, she hasn't heard me use the word malarkey lately, so she got, she got on to me a couple of weeks ago. She's been waiting for me to say malarkey for weeks now. I haven't said it. She said, I, I thought something was wrong. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Put a smile on her face today. Hallelujah. <laughs> malarkey. If he had created himself and gave himself his own brain and his own body, of course you could say he was a self-made man, but did he? No. Malarkey. Nuts to that. There is not one thing that we have that we have earned. Nothing. It's all a gift. And we don't deserve any of it. Somebody that I know uh, who is actually the nephew of James W. Moore, who does a lot of the uh, Bible study curriculums that is used in many churches and also used in this church. And his nephew is a member of my home church, Brantley. And uh, I can't remember Brantley Smith. I think mean, Brantley Smith. But Brantley always says if you meet him and you ask him how he's doing, he'll say, better than I deserve. Now, some of you listen to Dave Ramsey. I'm sure he got that from Dave Ramsey who does the financial guru stuff on the, the Christian radio networks. But Dave Ramsey, if somebody ever asked him, how are you doing? He'll say, better than I deserve. When we are truly humble like that, and that's what it means to be humble. To be humble is to know yourself. To know that you don't deserve one thing that you've got. To know that anything you have is a gift of God's grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul asked the Corinthians, what do you have that you have not received as a gift? What do you have that you have not received as a gift? Because you, everything that you have is a gift of God. So we can begin to be thankful when we get humble. When we get humble. And we can thank God. We can praise God. The hostility can be lifted from our hearts. The anger that we feel toward God can be lifted from our hearts. See, there, when they were talking about atheists in the Sunday school class down here, the secret Sunday school class, and, uh, you know, at, at the heart of atheism, I believe, is really not, not a disbelief in God as much as there's an anger toward God. C.S. Lewis said, Looking back on his life, and C.S. Lewis was one of the most prolific Christian authors of all time. He wrote many different things from a Christian perspective. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. He was born again. He was changed. He was transformed. And he became a great spokesperson for the Christian faith. He wrote back in the 40s and the 50s, and we still enjoy many of his works today. Many of our kids enjoy his works today. The Chronicles of Narnia and The Lion and the Witch and the Wardrobe, all written from a Christian perspective. But C.S. Lewis looked back on his life when he was an atheist, and he thought how ironic it was that he was so angry with this God that he claimed not to believe in. Angry. 
when we want to be thankful, if we want to be thankful, we've got to first be humble. Nothing that we have is anything that we have earned. Nothing. Especially not. Especially not eternal life. And we have that in Jesus Christ. We have that. God doesn't want anybody to perish. He doesn't want anybody to perish. If we, if we will accept the gift, and it can only be a gift, you know, I often ask people, you know, when we begin, somebody just asked me about it a little bit ago, you know, do you believe we can earn salvation? And it's just, I mean, absolutely not. I don't, like I said, I don't believe we can earn anything. Really and truly. It's all a gift. Especially salvation. And I just asked, uh, how many people have own a house? Do you own a house? Raise your hand if you own a house. Uh, did you pay for it in two minutes? Did, I mean, some of you may be able to. Uh, most of us probably couldn't. Uh, how many, well, don't worry about it. Some of you have a house you still have to pay for, right? Uh, how long, how many hours will you work to pay for that house? How many years will you work to pay for that house? Some 30 years? 30 year mortgage? And after 30 years, Russell, what do you have? A house that needs a new roof. A house that needs a new roof. <laughs> and maybe some new gutters. And new shutters. You have an old house. You have a house that gives you uh, a new, you have to go buy a new water heater. And you have all kinds of stuff. That's what you, you, you work. Think about how hard you worked. And what do you got? Now compare that to unending joy, unending peace, no more pain, no more suffering. How hard would you have to work? How much could you do? How much? Nothing. You can't do anything to earn it. It can only be received as a gift. And once we realize, when we get out of the entitlement mentality, and we realize that we have to be humble, that we have to come to God as a beggar, that we have to come to God as a beggar. When we receive communion, one of the, the ways to receive communion is to put left hand out. Everybody put your left hand out and put your right hand on top of it. And you come and you receive communion in this position because this is the position and the posture of a beggar. A beggar. And you can only receive it as a gift. And when you receive it as a gift, you receive Jesus Christ. And you are saved. You are changed. You are forgiven. You are transformed. You are set free. You are redeemed. And if you know that this morning, look, I, I've got to be honest with you. I mean, it's just, I don't think we really believe this stuff. Okay? I, I don't think sometimes we really believe. Because if you know today you've got eternal life as a gift, you have forgiveness if you know that today. But let me be walking on air. Walking on air with a song, a new song in your heart. Singing praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank God I am saved. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah, I am redeemed. Praise the Lord. What a foundation for a glorious and wonderful life. A life for which we can be thankful and grateful. We have to drive our minds to remember to not get fixated on the negative. To not get stuck. But to 
thank God for all of our blessings. All of them. And there's more than we could ever imagine. Thanks be to God.